<laughs> well, anyway. Well, anyway. <laughs> Deadpool is really good. Because that now that Father okay. God, then, it's really, really good. I'll check it out. It has some I'll um check it out. It has some predictive programming in it though. One hundred percent. I'm just gonna say Oh, what movie does it nowadays, right? That's, that's part of that's, the that's part of the game. Yeah. Yeah. It's part of the game, yeah. My uh I let my kids watch uh the sound of music. Oh, okay. And yeah, yeah and um it's it's crazy. I think I just think kids are way more sensitive than we think that they are. Because oh, yeah. like we watched that and like my son was genuinely like terrified when the Nazi showed up. He was genuinely Oh yeah, that's a was... scary that's a scary scene, yeah. But the they don't like do anything. There's no punching. There's no fighting. They're literally just chasing him, and like the part where like at the end where the nuns are like forgive me, mother, I have sinned, and they pull out the car parts from the Nazi's car. Yeah. Like my children, like I could feel like the tension leave their bodies. Like I yeah. like I was yeah. sitting next to him. I was just like, that's crazy. I just had to be more careful, I guess, a little bit of what they're seeing and how it's disturbing them. So hello, welcome to Royal Path. I'm your host, Andrew. Tonight I'm going to ask Cyprian and Father Turbo what, and remember, nothing's written in concrete. I'm just trying to get the conversation going. What is your favorite or what is the funniest movie you've ever seen? Like, doesn't even have to be, well, I mean, I guess it should be a comedy, I guess. That doesn't mean it has to be. But just flat out, when you think of the funniest, most it's probably half baked for me. Half I'm going to say it's half baked. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Or Groundhog Day. I like that too. Groundhog Day is good. Yeah. I think we but half, half baked is what I've said the most. I, I've said the most like where, cause I'm thinking, well, what are the funny ones where me and my friends would like repeat the yeah. things back and then we would laugh for years after it's gotta be half baked. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't even know. I'm just, right. I'm shuffle. I don't know. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. What'd you say, Father? What's yours? What? I said uh, Harlem Shuffle. I just threw something out there. Harlem Shuffle is good. Um, I I don't know. It's a, it's a tricky subject. I I don't think I this is my actual answer, but I just want to say. But I think the airplane is probably the funniest movie of all. Yeah. Time. Like that. Yeah. Humor, I still think of humor from that or jokes from that movie and. Have you seen the second one? The second airplane movie? Where it's like Yes, I have. Yeah. The mm-hmm. part where the guy's like walking through the dog. He's like, hey, no dogs. And he pulls out a gun and shoots it. <laughs> and then he's like, <laughs> Why? Why'd you shoot my dog? He's like, I'm just kidding. And the dog gets back. <laughs> like <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> to remain sober. I'm just gonna but anyway, I I think airplane's probably my favorite favorite, but there's a lot of them, you know, and obviously I'm I a- think I think it was so groundbreaking. Like I, you, you have to judge it against everything that had come before it and then judge it against today. And it's like, yeah, it still stands up. So That's and at bonkers. the time it was like, wow, incredible, you know, spoof genre. There's very mm-hmm. few of those movies I think are actually not funny. Like and Naked I'm not- Gun, the Naked, Naked Gun, Gun movies, man. Hot yeah. Shots. Like those oh, yeah. movies are just, and you know, it's Leslie Nielsen. It's all Leslie Nielsen. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. anyway, yeah, I can tell it's good. not father's forte. So we'll move on. I think we're warmed up. Um, I mean, here's my question though. I, th- 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 this is, it does draw something, right? Like draw something out. I feel like I haven't seen a funny movie. That's been like a new release movie. That's like funny where I'm really just like laughing nonstop. Like I used to with those movies, even when I was an adult, I feel like I haven't in probably 15 to 20 years. I could not, I could not think of one. 
It's because you haven't seen Deadpool and Wolverine. I was okay, like, fair enough. it's pretty fair hard enough. to make me laugh, like actually okay. laugh. And there was like tears coming down my face. Like, okay, like, okay, screams. okay. My, I went and saw it with my teenage daughter. And at one point, she like, put her hand on my shoulder and she's like, are you okay? And I was like, <laughs> I, I am dying laughing. Like, okay, I got to see feeling it. Feeling me funny. Like, okay, it's just, all right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, yeah I mean, I and there's it. still, there's a couple. I mean, there's the whole, I'm not all a bun- into a bunch of them, but like the Judd Apatow stuff, like Pineapple Express, like it, I don't want to watch yeah. it again. But I remember it being really funny at the time. Like, yeah. uh, like super of- bad, super bad. And, uh, I you never want to yeah. watch it again, but I thought it was funny at the time. Like, I remember laughing. Um, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe we're past that age. Everything's too serious now. So, anyway, I don't. Can... I I like. I don't know. I like to laugh. I laugh at stand up comedy. You know, stand up comedy, man. I uh, I think that that's actually probably would have been the better question. Who's your favorite stand up comic, Father? Do you have a favorite stand up comic? <laughs> Come on, there's got to be someone you like. <sighs> Dave Chappelle before they got that. Him. Mine's mine's the same. It's half baked and it's Dave Chappelle. So like I'm not I'm I'm not very I mean, creative here. I think that Ryan Long guy is kind of funny. Ryan Long funny. is pretty yeah. gosh darn funny. He's pretty funny. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's also a guy named mm-hmm. Sam Campbell. He's Australian. If you guys, I'm not saying you guys will ever will, but any anyone in the audience, that guy is absolutely hilarious. There's a couple of them too. I like. But anyway, let's move on. So you guys have something that you were blown up in the chat before we started mm-hmm. recording that I don't know anything about. So what's going on? I don't know how we should approach this, Father. I had this little, like, kind of cute uh, yeah, thing. Yeah, try that. You want to try the little cute thing? Mm-hmm. Okay. So I'm going to read for everybody um, seven tenets. Okay? Seven this tenets. Pre production as we get, I guess. Yeah, this is close to the pre-production as we get. So I'm going to read seven tenets. You're I'm welcome. not going to tell you wh- where they are from. And then I guess after we're done, Father, we'll give it a beat and then tell everybody where they're from. Is that what it is? And then we can yep. start talking about what we're talking about? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Yep. All right. Perfect. So tenet number one. One should strive to act with compassion and empathy toward all creatures in accordance with reason. Okay. Tenet number two. The struggle for justice is an ongoing and necessary pursuit that should prevail over laws and institutions. Uh, Tenet three. One's body is inviolable, subject to one's own will alone. Tenet four. The freedoms of others should be respected, including the freedom to offend. To willfully and unjustly encroach upon the freedoms of another is to forego one's own. Uh, Tenet five, beliefs should conform to one's best scientific understanding of the world. One should take care never to distort scientific facts to fit one's beliefs. Uh, Tenet number, that was tenet number five. Tenet number six, people are fallible. If one makes a mistake, one should do one's best to rectify it and resolve any harm that might have been caused. And then tenet number seven, every tenet is a guiding principle designed to inspire nobility in action and thought. The spirit of compassion, wisdom, and justice should always prevail over the written or spoken word. Those are the seven fundamental tenets. And you know what, Father? What's interesting about this is like, in my libertarian days, I would read this and be like, yeah, totally. Yeah. Like, if I read that at the Free State Project as the, as a little presentation, I'd get up, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, where do yeah we like those. So should I? Do you want to say something before I I share where these are from? Yeah, the only thing I want to say is, um, and I'll say it. You might have to read them again, but yep. interestingly enough, I mean, this just came to me. Tenet four and five could only be really adopted large scale, um, definitely in the West, but maybe in the world only after. After what? Because only after what? Say again. Only after only after twenty. Only after two thousand twenty. Yeah. 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 Four and five. 
Mm-hmm. Four and five. So let me read. Let me read four and five again, just in case people uh, don't remember. So number four: the freedoms of others should be respected, including the freedom to offend. To willfully and unjustly encroach upon the freedoms of another is to forego one's own. So that sounds very much like the right of today. Like that's a, that would be a very Elon Musk type of uh, tenet, I would think. Uh, the the freedom of others should be respected, including the freedom to offend. This is very much the the sort of the the right, the new right. And then five is really more of the left, I think, after 20. Beliefs should conform to one's best scientific understanding of the world. One should take care never to distort scientific facts to fit one's belief. But I guess that this would probably fit in with like the Weinstein brothers too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. They're always talking about that. Yeah, I mean, I think yep. it could, I think there's definitely a, a narrative in the right that absolutely supports that. I think that they would say, you guys did distort the facts mm-hmm. of 20 because those numbers were not that high. You distorted the science. It was never right. that the science was the science was the infallible truth. It was just that yeah. that person, the left took that infallible truth and manipulated it. So I think but that also, t- yeah, forgive me, but also too. The right to offend. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So free speech absolutism. You couldn't really get that large, large scale in the West. You had to bring the woke regime. You had to bring the backlash for people to be like, because look, this is this is the big thing they're wrestling with. You know, the lack of tact. Like everything needs to be jettisoned for the greatest good of being able to say whatever you want, even if I need to offend. Right. Mm-hmm. So. You couldn't really get a large scale adoption of that unless you had, you know, the the extreme of the of the left really mm-hmm. ushering that in for the backlash for the for the reaction, you know. So, so should I show where this is from? Should yeah, I show where it's from? If or you not? could just one second, Cyprian. Yeah, I w- I'm worried that right there we'll have someone say that's too cryptic. So I want to break that down just really quick. I don't know yeah, how much ahead. more base we can make it. But yeah. I just want to say that because that's important. So, yeah. Father, if you don't mind, tell it like you're talking to me. Like, break it down to my level a little bit. Yeah, so the hyper-political correctness that the West has been swimming under for a while, which reached its crescendo. Well, it's been reaching its crescendo. I mean, it's not quite there, but we're, we're about at the crescendo, right? So that hyper-correctness, right, and the way that it's caused people um, to just, you know, the overcorrection, the backlash to it. Mm-hmm. So now the right, the ability to, to speak, even if, even the right to offend as, as a value. Yeah. A virtue. Right? As a virtue, excuse me, as a virtue, you really couldn't get that large scale social adoption without something, without the years that we've been under in regards of the, the um, mm-hmm. political correctness and the absurdity. That's, that's one of the things about the absurdity of, of, of the woke regime is that the absurdity, because the thought is, you know, getting back to, uh, you were talking last night about, uh, after the recital, uh, about the Babylon Beast kit and the devil's like, hey, tone it down a little bit mm-hmm. right <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. right but the yeah. thing is is you need because the thought is it's absurd i mean there's a lot of people who you know moving in early 2000s mid 2000s whatever but it's like okay you know the the idea because remember something about quote unquote woke that it, it originally started off with what it meant to be woke was to see through the paradigm, the narrative yeah. and to, uh, of, you know, the power structure that beat that the yeah. power structure that is mm-hmm. and to recognize where that power structure had been oppressive, which is true. Yeah. There's, there, there's, there's absolute truth to that, but that seed, like every other seed of truth that the devil uses then begins to become, you know, it becomes it like cuts you. It's like an invasive species that takes mm-hmm. everything over. 
and it begins to become its own its own animal. Which that whole movement we've talked we talk a lot about this. There's this same concept behind nonprofits and all these things where the thing wants to begin to exist on its own. So it's mm-hmm. fundamentally idolatry, mm-hmm. right? The yeah. seed of idolatry where the truth is no longer that nugget of truth isn't there to serve the understanding to lead someone to wholeness, to completeness, which is found in God, mm-hmm. right? But it becomes self-serving and it becomes mm-hmm. idolatrous in its self-serving aspect. And so that initial seed of, of woke, which is, you know, waking up to the truth of these power structures, you take it to its furthest conclusion, you add in enough, you know, idolatry, because anything without God is going to turn into idolatry. That's mm-hmm. the point. Anything that is that has a seed of good without Christ becomes idolatry. Without God right. becomes idolatry. Yeah. Without the true God, I should say, becomes idolatry. So all of that leads us to this place of, you know, people responding to, I am so sick of these extremes that the wokes right. push. Right. And so that's why, in many ways, Donald Trump. Um, yep. I mean, I was even observing this, you know, I can't remember what it was, but there used to be, there was a skit, um, maybe it was Keen Peel, might have been something earlier, um, which by the way, Keen Peel's funny, Keen Peel's funny, so how's that? Yeah, um, there you go. Anyways, all right, there you go, all right. Um, but it was, you know, a kind of skit on black conservatives. It might oh, have yeah. been, it might have been SNL, whatever. They're all but, married to white women. <laughs> yeah, and they're all mad. <laughs> They're all yeah, angry. Right, right. Like every single one of them is like mad and angry. And so I'm just oh, bringing yeah. that up because they that keep getting that, up to the mic. Yeah, they keep getting up to the mic. It's like, I'm mad. Yeah, I know what yeah. you're talking about now. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah that, so that stereotype is interesting because, I mean, there's truth to it. And, and just the cur- conservative in general. I mean, the conservative uses the energy. And we can have a whole conversation. I don't want to derail too much, but there, there's, there's, when you start moving with a conservative mindset in, in the culture, one of the things you have to begin to wield is the type of anger because you're, you're trying to yes. make a voice for the good. So it's, so it's almost the same movement as, yes. you know, you, you find the need to kind of to gritty up Superman a little bit, you know, there, there's a need to give mm-hmm. a little bit of grit to the, to the goody goody because the good in that sense is, is deemed as, you know, too soft and all these things, right? So that same insight, that same movement is where you, we start getting this common thing where I see a lot of conservatives where it's just, you know, the, the mindset as I'm angry about this and I'm angry about that. Mm. And so that temptation is a perfect play off of that movement of the extreme absurdity of the left. Mm-hmm. So it, it's almost mm-hmm. as if you have the dry tender, you know, the all, all the kindling and the spark. You put the two together and you got a fire, right? Mm-hmm. So the dry kindling is get people just outraged, right? We always talk about the, the outrage, mm-hmm. right? But there's, there's a basis in it. And then you get this other tendency, which is latent when you're, you know, I'm fighting for the right, you know, you know pun mm-hmm. intended, whatever. Boom, you have, you have the spark. So... Getting back to our main thing, tenets four, especially the right, you know, basically even to offend. Could you read it again, please? Tenet yes, four? yes, I will. Yes, I will. Tenet four is the freedoms of others should be respected, including the freedom to offend. To willfully and unjustly encroach upon the freedoms of another is to forego one's own. So this is one of the things about. I'm sorry, but it's one of the things again about um, Donald Trump and the and the current mm-hmm. upcropping of libertarian, conservative right political leaders in general. There's a certain say it like it is that we all enjoy because mm-hmm. it's a common mm-hmm. man, and I and I understand that. But the reality is, is you know that common man is is put as a virtue of something that we should strive for versus something, Mm -hmm. you know, that we just accept. Right. And so, well, and this is father, forgive me. This is a, this common man, this common man being up high is 
the common man is necessarily the fallen, a representation of fallen man. So it's like a really anti-Christ. It's anti, it, it, it would be anti-Christian to do, to place that as the highest. We don't, we, we, we place the saints as the highest who are definitely not the common man. That's what yeah. makes them saints is Correct. that they're not common, right? They're rare. Correct. Correct. And people, just to make it really simple, which thank you, Andrew, you know, some people, and we can all appreciate, the, let's say, the perceived gruffness of St. Paisios, let's say. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's one of us, you know. But that's not what makes him a saint. And I think people need to understand that. What makes St. Paisios a saint isn't the fact that he could, you know, give him a good run and just speak to people. We enjoy that. I enjoy it. It's, it's, yeah. it's fine. Yeah. But that's not what makes him a saint. And so mm -hmm. when we have these things which are, you know, base you know, base understandings, which are fine, but we, we have to be very careful. And that's the name of the game in all of this is that these things aren't Christianity. These things aren't orthodoxy. These things aren't the, these aren't what we are to be putting in the, in the place of anti of virtue, right? If Christ dwells fully in the virtues, St. Maximus, the confessor, then when we do not understand where virtue is the source of virtue, yes. when we don't understand what virtues are, what are we being set up for? Yes. Right? Well, so maybe, maybe, maybe in the place of. if it's not Christianity, maybe that's the perfect, because it's not, but maybe that's the perfect segue for us to, to show people what these tenets are. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So these are the seven fundamental tenets of the satanic temple which is the, the break-off group from the Church of Satan. So they don't like each other anymore. There's basically two sa satanic churches. These are the Protestants of the Church of Satan, started by Anton LaVey. So the reason why this came up, uh, why I brought it up is because it, I, I saw that um, Jordan Peterson had platformed... Um, Zena yeah. LeVay, now Shrek, um, which is interesting, Father, because we specifically were talking about her like maybe five episodes ago. Yep. Right? Yep. We Not even five. Not even Four, five. maybe? Where we brought up a picture of her towards the end of the show. We're like, oh, yeah, she's a doppelganger of Taylor Swift. She hadn't been in the news or anything for a long time, man. Decades. No. And, you know... We're just having fun, having a little conversation. But um, it's it's interesting because again, uh, this has been the first time. You know, I want to bring it up here. It's just been percolating in the back of my mind, and I don't want to distract too much. I do want to tackle um, Zena's um, yep interview, but there's something to the fact that you know Taylor Swift was involved in the kickoff for the UK riots. I know it's a long, I know it's a long uh... arc. I know that, you know, just getting all the low hanging fruit. The, oh, um, wait, it was a Taylor Swift dance class. That's yeah. right. Yeah. That, so, the, that the initial ritual right. happened at. That's right. So Whoa. Let's, let's just, and it was let's, a stabbing. Yeah. Yeah. So let's. A child let, sacrifice. Let, what so in the world? I hadn't even put it together. Right. Oh, no. So, so let's just get the low hanging fruit out of the way. Yes. Um, mass immigration used as a weapon to destabilize no problem right check but again we talked a couple episodes about let's let's try to get people to have a you know a kind of schema by which they can understand things there's like the three levels of understanding how all this works right so on that low level right of course you know there's well the mid level actually right the principalities there's the weaponization of mass immigration and the tension that's being you know fomented in the West because it's not just the UK but in the West in Europe and now here with the immigration problems that's all there acknowledging it right and we can have a whole conversation um, about that ploy and the way that it accelerates the the tension between you know really the people, class, mm -hmm. struggle, all those things, right? But it's very interesting, isn't it? That it and wow. it's so interesting because it isn't 
kind of like a secondary obscure fact behind it. No, no. everything that I had seen, the Taylor Swift part of it was has been like a, a major part of the narrative because it's never Taylor not Swift, mentioned. Forgive me, yeah, Father. It's never it's not, never mentioned. not no. mentioned. It's never not mentioned, and 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 the context of it being mentioned is this air of innocence. And I want to be very clear with everyone: this isn't about trying to. Um, downplay the terror, the horrible things that happen. Just to be clear, it's not talking about those poor, those poor girls and, and everything that happened in the town. Hey, what, maybe if everyone what, from the audience could pray for them, you know, it's just like yeah. that. There you go. Yeah. But what I'm trying to get at is this is this is the thing, right? There is a promoting of the image of Taylor Swift, and there's a continuing movement to try to associate Taylor Swift with a kind of more positive, um, youthful, just aspect of, of culture and society, especially in, you know, in the West. Now, someone could say this whole thing about, well, pop stars are always the case and that, that's always the thing. But I would just say this, um, and this gets us, we could, we, this is a whole other thing itself. I just, I don't remember like Madonna enjoying. No, no, no. There's never, no, there's never been anything like this, Father. She's you know, a not, unique phenomenon in and of herself. It's, it's a very unique thing. You you saw precursors with like, let's say a Britney Spears. You know, you mm -hmm. saw precursors that were, that were, you know, priming the pump. But mm -hmm. Taylor Swift, you know, being born in her rise and her, the culmination of all these things. I'm, you know, it, I, I can't remember a phenomena like her where you have subsequently such obvious, from our perspective, connections to, to you know, dark spiritual forces, with, you know, the the, the pop and the bubble gum in such a way. Yeah, Madonna has always been there. Madonna's been blasphemous, all those, all those things. But the association sure. with with youth culture, in particular, in this kind of explicit way. Um, it's fascinating because she gets a pass in certain ways that Madonna didn't get a pass. I remember Madonna broke the scene. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I'm old enough to remember. And mm -hmm. it was, it was, she was scandalous on those things, but there was enough of that edge. Like, Oh, you know, it's <laughs> you know, oh, well, she, Madonna wasn't for kids. Madonna, Madonna was kids. like a bar. She was a bar singer, like CBGB. Like that was, it, yeah. she was for like yeah. young, young adults, yeah. teenagers when and she above. Broke. It when wasn't she broke. For, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Then, and then as she, you know, became more a part of the, you know, the kind of milieu for, for pop culture, that that's a thing, but she was never for mm -hmm. children that same way. And so I would say for me, and again, I'm not, you know, we're not experts on like pop culture in regards to like youth movement, but in this sense, in regards to like, you know, teen girls. But again, the only thing I can think of is, you know, you have this movement with like, again, a Britney Spears, a t uh, um, what's her name? Mm -hmm. Aguilera. Christina um, Aguilera. Christina yeah. Aguilera. You know, like there's this movement of the kind of bait and switch that began to become almost like formulaic. And so Ariana where, Grande, Selena Gomez. You know? They're all the same kind of, but Taylor Swift is totally different than all of them yeah. in terms of the magnitude of her stardom Jeez. and the, and the, and who is following her. Definitely. Like, because it's like, it's like wine moms who are getting together in groups, dressing up like little girls and going to Taylor Swift concerts. It's not, it's like adults mm -hmm. it's behaving like, like children because she's 35 years old. She's not, they portray her like she's some teenager. She's 35. She's a grown woman. But, <laughs> but again, I, I've mentioned this before. You know, I have, um, I have, you know, younger women in my care who much of their psychological and spiritual, um, you know, struggles were not, you know, they're not, she's not the source of them, but she's that mm. vehicle. She's that um, herald by which mm -hmm. certain dispositions you know, became attractive, right? So mm -hmm. if I can just say real quick, I know I've told this story before, but my sweet little Xenia, uh, who is now six, she, when she was younger, this is pre-2020, um, maybe even at a little post, uh, my wife would listen to Taylor Swift a lot because it was simple. It was fun, whatever. Yep. Like, yep. 
It didn't sound like it was anything too complicated. And my wife was just adjusting to becoming a mom. So she would just turn on Taylor Swift or whatever. Just it was music to listen to. Um, and as we started to notice, as she got older, like two or three, she started getting really obsessed with like boys. She started talking about boys quite a bit. And like she would uh, during church, she'd go like sit next to boys and they would sit there and just like kind of like act all cute. Mind you, this girl is still wearing a diaper. Like she, Right. you know, this is just the effect that this is having. When we realized, and it stopped when we realized what was going on and we stopped listening to Taylor Swift. You know, not that as we as a family are just sitting around the old campfire just listening to Taylor Swift, but like now it's like, and that her music, I mean, I'm a music fan and even just walking through like whatever the grocery store and it's playing, I'm like, I get why this is so hypnotic. It's so Oh yeah. like, it's, it's so It's the like, siren song. It's it the is. siren song. So, but anyways, um, Oh, sorry. no, no, no. That, that's, that's a great anecdotal, you know, kind of reinforcement. Um, thank you for sharing. It. So, you know, I just, I look at that reality and again, that it's such a part of the, of unfortunately the weaponization of that terrible event. And so, Um, I think that this is important to bring up because no matter how you want to cut it, we can make it as, you know, so, you know, kind of sensationalist and uh, as we'd like. Um, but I, I think at the core of, of an honest and real conversation, there's a real problem there. Um, and when you see now this platforming, um, of, you know, Zinnia, um, was it Shrek now? Shrek, yeah. It's an interesting. How do you how do you spell her last name? By the way, now. S C H R E C K, I believe. Hmm. I can see. It's uh, S C H R E C K. Yeah. Yeah. So, but this Shrek is this a fun platforming movie. with her, and you know, I think the thing we were talking about was you know just within that first five minutes of the interview. And Well, let's just first. let's. I I figured we could play the first five minutes, Yep. at, and the the we won't play Jordan Peterson's intro, but I think it's important because he clearly does this intro at, after, and then it's pegged on to the front where he describes it. But one of the important things is that he's the the sort of context, the underlying foundation that he's trying to get at. It seems is dealing with. trauma childhood trauma and he it's the the pretense of that he's bringing her on is that her father was a terrible person and that she has sort of she was raised in this terrible environment and she has sort of overcome that that's like what he's trying to do but it's pretty clear in the first i mean let's just play the first five minutes and then father i mean there's so much to talk about in there So much to talk about. So let's just uh, let's just do that. Hold on. Uh, how do I do this? Let's see. Share sound. Yeah. Optimize. Here we go. All right. If you can't if you can't hear it, let me know when it starts to play. Zena, thank you very much for agreeing to talk with me and everyone today. Uh, I guess I'm I'm curious. You've had a very st strange life. And uh, I, I want to describe that. I guess I'm curious to first for myself before we delve into any of the details. What what do you think we could accomplish with this conversation? What's what's the utility of the conversation as far as you're concerned? Well, well that's a good question. Well, it's also a big question. Uh, I suppose in the bigger picture. Uh, Since I, I don't normally break apart bits of my past to discuss, it only comes up anecdotally in relation to where I am today. I always prefer to live in the present. Um, that's in accordance with my Buddhist practices. Uh, but if I were to think of an overall uh, accomplishment of what we get across today, I think it might be to reassure those who might be watching who live in difficult situations uh, or difficult families or really dysfunctional uh, conditions in life that 
uh, they should not give up hope and that there is a way out and to always remember that everything is impermanent if we practice patience and diligence in trying to find our own course that is in alignment with who we truly are. Um, I think that the only thing I really have to offer, because everybody has adversity in their life, uh, but in my case, maybe the only thing I have to offer is that um, people who are raised with certain conditioning or certain um, you know, belief systems that through that they've learned through childhood that they really n never had an opportunity to question or they even if they did question it, they always felt they had to defend it on behalf of their parents, whatever that may be, whether it's religion or politics or corporations or, uh, you know, profession or anything that if there are people who who felt that because of their early life conditioning that um that they're just stuck and they're that's their destiny and that's their fate and they really can't do anything about it and there's no way out that i would at least hope that uh my life's experiences and and my life story can provide a example amongst many others in in this world and in history um of the fact that if you have strength of character, if you have a greater vision, if you have, um, you know, a willingness to change, that it is possible to break the conditionings that were placed upon you against your wishes. Well, so there's a couple of themes in there that are, I think, personally and sociologically relevant. I mean, on a I think we could probably pause and yeah, we're good go there. from there. No, yeah, man. Hold on, I can't. Yeah, I mean, I can't hear you guys. Hold on. Okay, now I can. Yeah. Okay. It it gets a little bit more even in in further into that um, because even all that you hear, and you're like, well, that sounds great. That, that so sounds maybe really we could good. start to break down some of the some mm -hmm. of the things that she said that are like clearly, I mean. Father, you said it. I, I'm I'm going to quote you because it was so good. Like, you know, you said when you heard it, you were like, "Oh, first six minutes, she's still clearly a Satanist, yeah. but she's wrapped it in rice paper, talking about yeah. the Buddhism." <laughs> and I thought that was so poignant and perfect. Yeah, because yeah. you can you still know, hear that language shining through. Like, there's mm -hmm. just you can, and and just for everyone's context. You know, again, it's not that much further. Um, uh, little side note, I listen to things at like 1.75, sometimes at 2. Um, <laughs> so I was like, oh, man, she's really slow. But <laughs> anyways, uh, <laughs> even a little bit further, you know, just these tenants that, that come forward, not these exact verbatim seven tenants that we were mentioning before, but that ethos is still there. And it's still... And it, and it becomes very explicit, not that much further into the interview. And really, it's it's throughout the whole interview that it becomes very explicit. That do you this, want me to go for? Do you want me to go further just for the sake of us being able to? And yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Let me do it. No. We all. What would you say are the beneficiaries and victims of the actions of the past? And I suppose that's true most proximally with regard to who it is that you have in your family of birth and your parents. And they're, they have their individ, in, individual idiosyncrasies and um, talents. And then they are also exemplars of the much broader culture. Now, your father was a very famous man, an extraordinarily controversial person. You know, I was reading the satanic rituals this morning and hmm. back, you know, I'm old enough, so I kind of caught the tail end of the hedonistic 60s. You know, I'm really a kid yeah. of the 70s and the 70s was where the 60s went I. to die. <laughs> so, 
And I always say that the 70s are the hangover of the 60s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's exactly right. The Yeah, the drunken because hangover. It was even, a really yeah. ugly hangover. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. It, it really was. And, uh, you know, when I was 18 or 19, I spent a fair bit of time investigating Aleister Crowley and also your father's works and familiarizing myself with the dark side of the 1960s, you know, looking at how that had affected the music, for example, of the Rolling Stones and the the vicious underbelly of the, what would you say, carefree hedonism, let it all hang out, tune in, turn on, drop out ethos of the 1960s. It's like, that's all fine, boys and girls, but, you know, there's a pretty dark shadow that comes along with that. And it's like the shadow of the Marquis de Sade for the French Enlightenment. And these aren't the sorts of things that people like to delve into, uh, except carelessly and foolishly, that's for sure, and pridefully. And, you know, it, it was quite a trip down memory lane in some ways to take a look at this book today because I haven't thought about those things in relationship to the early 60s or the early 70s and the late 60s for quite a long time. So you were right in the middle of this. And so what, what you're, maybe you could start by telling people who your father was and then also when you were born so we can place you exactly in time. And then I think we'll probably go through your life autobiographically and 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 let you tell your story. So let why don't you tell everybody who your father was to begin with? Okay. Yeah, so first of all, you know, I was born in 1963 and uh, my father was Anton LaVey, so he was the founder of the Church of Satan, which uh, coincided with being the founder of modern day Satanism uh, as a cohesion kind of organizational, uh, openly public organization for, for Satanists. Not that Satanism didn't exist before, but it was always, uh, you know, in secret or was practiced very differently from the way my father practiced it. Um, uh, let me back up and clarify something when you were discussing about the hedonism of the 60s and um and the dark side and the rolling stones kind of altamont type things that were happening then the interesting thing to understand about my father and his organization was that they were a generation older than the hippie generation and as such they they were like mostly comprised of the members were mostly uh, people who were young in the post-war generation of the 50s. So, so in so in a strange way, um, you could consider that the Church of Satan always considered itself the counterculture to the counterculture, because we were. Um, my father, <laughs> my father was really very anti-hippie, and. Um, so this is where it gets complicated because it doesn't fit into it doesn't fit into the stereotypical idea one has of Satanism in 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 the occult milieu. Um, so it's a little bit complicated because my father was an, anti-occultist actually, and he was really much more of a performer and a showman and. Um, very Machiavellian, of course. Uh okay. Do we want to just like address that for one second? Yeah, I just want to ad hold on, hold on. I can't go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Father. I think this is it's, it's an important place for us to at least yeah. address because moving even beyond her, I just want to say this one thing. This is this is one of the biggest problems that I think people run into when they think about these things is this very stereotype of Satanists and, you know, not to say that this isn't the case, but like she just saying, it's they were the, the counterculture to the counterculture and this, mm -hmm. um, the makeup in which LaVey and, and really remember, we're talking about Sammy Davis Jr. We're talking about, mm -hmm. <laughs> We're talking about figures in society who converted that, to Judaism, by the way, Sammy Davis Jr. Converted yeah. to Judaism. Just let's keep that yeah. in mind. Let's keep that in mind. Um, we're, we're talking about a um, 
respectability to some degree that has always been a part of the narrative in which you know satanism is is portrayed and so that you know agenda that disposition to want to present it as a respectable um, and, and even her making this point about her dad coming from essentially she's saying my dad was more of a square than people realize yes and so this is this is key because the you know um hot topic satanist with you know that that's all fine and dandy but that's not really what the concern is and i would just say this to, this is the thing this is why we're talking about it and the how he said you know my father was even like anti occultist you know um occultists in in the sense that what she's talking about that her father was was opposed to um you know a lot of these occultists are are very much you know like how we would look at um i hate i'll, I'll use this analogy um and i i, I know <clears throat> i know it well at least from the eighties but you know um like this the neo nazi skinheads and the really extreme you know kind of shock troops of let's say you know like white supremacy right they're they're not the problem the problem is you know the judges the doctors the the people in power that are part of the power structure that are you know facilitate you know these ideas you know coming in and, and it's, it's it's the sub the subversion and it's the same thing getting back to um i would say in regards of the confusion that people are, are swimming in with let's say the riots in the uk or everywhere in regards to the migrant issue is that on the one hand right and then being in this conversation people would say in fact, I, you know, I had that interview not too long ago with um, DPH and understanding that there's people like, but, you know, it, someone wanting their homeland and all this, this isn't wrong. And I'm not saying it's wrong, but what I'm trying to get across is that when you look to see who is allowing these things to happen, right, um, the wars, the, the wars that were propagated by those with power struck, those in the you know um, military industrial complex, right? Because these are the ones who are you know they are the ones that are making up the fabric of of the greater you know society economically, socially, and they're the ones who these are the upstanding people. They're the ones who have these. They're the ones who have these satanic, you know, agendas and and ideas and movements, um, and they're the ones who, on the larger scale are you know basically weaponizing um populations to destabilize you know societies and cultures in such a way that you know again the 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 synthesis is is almost inevitable now because those movements are on each side robed in a sense of decency no one no one is outright saying you know hey <laughs> child sacrifice but yet abortion is a huge problem in Russia. Abortion is a huge problem in Romania. I'm saying that intentionally. Orthodox countries, quote unquote, right? No one's saying, hey, but yet you have these huge numbers of abortion. Well, what is it at its core, right? We all know about the Moloch worship, right? So this is, this is the thing when you begin to understand that the real issue isn't what you, what you think you're outraged about. It's the thing that's galvanizing you and motivating you. And if it isn't, for the sake of Christ, then just morality, civic morality is essentially just paganism. Because when you break down those tenets, you know, getting back to our original thing, all those tenets are things that most people go like, yeah, that's great. Right. And so what she, what she's done wittingly, unwittingly, it kind of doesn't matter, which is another point is it's still taking the, the essence of the spirituality of Satanism, a satanic perspective, and it's just finding a way to package it to make it more palatable. So in our, you know, you know, Blessed Sarah from Rose, Saint Sarah from Rose, you talk, you know, the the advent of the rise, you know, the advent of 
Eastern religions in the West, right? Well, it's such a thing now where Buddhism obviously is like, hey, that's okay. You know, you know as soon as you, you, you give it that veneer of Buddhism, it gives it an air of respectability, mm-hmm. um, enculturation. It, it shows you're being cultured. It's intelligent. It's sophisticated. It, but it's essentially the same. She's rapping, and it's, it's still a satanic ideology of, like, the will, you know, the, the, the pushing of the will, all of these things, which um, you just remove some of the more showman-esque accoutrement, and here you go. This is, this is what she's promoting. And it's, it's more clear as you go further in the, in the um, interview. But I think this is an important thing to, to bring up first and foremost. There's a so there's a, a couple of things. One, I find it highly ironic, and I don't know if Jordan Peterson is just a useful idiot or what's going on in this situation. Well, one thing you notice that he didn't wear his uh, his icon jacket for this one, so <laughs> we noticed that. Uh, we we noticed that because a real a real Christian would have. Like, if I'm going to talk to a Satanist, I'm bringing icons. You know like, what I'm saying? the one time, the one time you should have <laughs> yeah, worn the jacket. Real. Yeah. <laughs> right? Okay. So that's that's the first thing. The second thing that I find interesting is um, she's talking. She, If you're anybody who's got a good sense of pattern recognition, it's like she's specifically saying to him, let me correct something that you said. Yeah. Like, you seem to be insinuating mm-hmm. that this was part of the left counter the the left counterculture i'm going to tell you you're wrong this was the counterculture to the counterculture and what's so ironic is this is being broadcast on daily wire mm. by jordan peterson which mm. is the counterculture to the counterculture right right mm. right mm. right it's it's, it's like no actually <laughs> say you are a satanist platform that's why i'm on your platform right mm-hmm. now Mm-hmm. Is because this is this is exactly the platform. Well, I find that pro- super interesting. See the problem. The, I think let me just say this real quick. I think the problem right now is, you know, there's people who can't hear what we're saying because of the various right. things, you know. Um, but it, it's like anything else. If you take away the fact, you know, on the one hand, we have to say Satanists to make it explicit for people, right? But on the other hand, making it explicit is what ca- causes them to turn it out and be like. This is just satanic. You guys are just basically doing satanic panic stuff. And it's like, no. No, we're not. Because because the thing is, is again, kind of some of the being self-aware in the sense of like what Andrew brought up of the need, obviously, which is great, to really start breaking things down. And I'm just I'm hearing that. And so that's why we have to go go down this route and become somewhat explicit to get people to understand like the whole purpose, again, to forgive the self-awareness of our project is to really, with God's help. But just to say, you know, what what is the thing that you need to what are the things we need to to be watching for in this new era? We are in a new era. We are in a we are in a new time. We are now in a place where things are being formulated in such a way that if it was even possible, the elect would be deceived. Whether that is a cycle. And we have, you know, 500 more cycles to come. I don't know. But I know in this cycle right now, right, where people, um, all of the points of conversation we talk about in regards of the influence of the Internet, orthodoxy in the Internet, the rise of conservatism, you know, the backlash against wokeism, all these things are really coalescing here in, in this sense because now you're having, again, you're having morality and, and quote unquote virtue presented in such a way that really your average person, your average quote unquote Christian, and especially the person who's intoxicated on outrage, isn't going to discern what's being put across. I would I we didn't do it, but I, I think if I remember correctly, I would imagine um and I don't know much about them, but I imagine some of this out, you know, it's parallel or complementary to the georgia guidestones you know it's there's mm. oh i think it's it's the same it's very close this is all very know, close it's the scientism technocracy yeah. individualism yeah. yeah and she later on in the interview she talks about her exploration phase and of course you know it's promoted as it was this great thing peterson promotes as this, this great thing is development um but she talks about you know 
find trying to find when she left formally the Church of Satan, and she began to really try to find a system by which she could, you know, find some measure of meaning. She talks about beginning to explore paganism, Hinduism, and, and other things. And again, all this is in in the um, context of, and that's the narrative of the Satanist: is that, hey, we are valid, we are, you know, peaceful, more and all those things. But the point I'm trying to get across with with this little this little thing here is that paganism, right? If again, if people are just thinking you know, the um, the sensationalist idea about, you know, people running around in the woods with, you know, horns and, and, you know, kind of, that's fine. But understand it better in regards to civic religion. Hmm. See, people, when we talk about paganism as Orthodox Christians, and we talk about the problem with paganism, people think about the sensational in regards of, you know, people LARPing, and drinking, you know, goat's blood from a goblet and all that stuff. No, the problem is the civic religion aspect of it, right? And that's that's important because the civic religion is much more akin to what people would relate to than the actual tenets of Christianity as they are expressed and lived out in the traditions of the Orthodox Church. That's but they don't know, point. Father. Forget, Father. Forgive me. They don't. They don't know the like. So th this is what's coming to my mind. Like Vladimir Putin has been calling the United States the kingdom of Satan. Mm -hmm. And I think people have been like, oh, he's being so hyperbolic and all of that. But when you look at those seven tenets, you're like, wait a minute. But is is not every Paul is not Elon Musk. Who's like you know, the, the example of America to the world as like the most wealthy man. Is he not espousing these seven tenets every day? Is are these not like held as the highest virtues? And then I think to to, to the point of that, it's like I, I want to just read the part that she said that I that I like wrote down because I thought it was just she said at the end of the first little segment, she said, if you have strength of character, if you have a greater vision, if you have a willingness to change then it is possible to break the condition conditionings that were placed upon you against your wishes. And I read that as an Orthodox Christian. And I'm like, if you have strength of character, I don't, we don't. That's why we need Christ. Mm -hmm. If we had, right. if any of us had strength of character, we wouldn't need Christ. Then if you have a greater wisdom, greater wisdom than who? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A greater wisdom. The whole point is I don't. <laughs> <laughs> like right, that's what it right. that's why I need Christ. And then it's like, if you have a willingness to change, and it's like change into what? Into because what? I don't even know what I'm supposed to change into. Into what? And then it, she says, and... then it is possible to break the conditionings that were placed upon you against your wishes. And it's like, no, but not my will, thy will be done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what my wishes are are my wishes are BS. And, and, and so it's like Antichrist. The whole thing that she just presented is Antichrist. It's completely Antichrist. And again, the problem is, and this is the key, the problem is if someone's like, you guys are stretching. It's like, this, this, is, this is my point, is that people don't realize, again, people who are coming to the Orthodox Church, especially within the last few years, they... What they are being motivated by a lot of times is, is and what they want to move to, and it's to some degree, what people want to make orthodoxy into is like, is, is a, they want to have and they assume the morality of the church is much more akin to this pagan, the mm. civic religion. And that's the thing is the radical aspect. This is, this is, and I'm going to kind of play this a little bit, but that radical aspect of the church is being lost. That radical aspect of Christianity is being lost and it's being neutered in the, as it becomes watered down, right? And that's the thing about Antichrist. Antichrist, right? Let's, let's, let's not make it about the person, right? But the system, right? Let's make it about the spirit of Antichrist, right? And that's always about that. It's not about like the Antichrist or capital A, C. But that spirit is always in the place of. So let's 
tamper down the exclusive claims of orthodoxy. Let's tamper that down, okay? Um, El Diboforos, tampering it down. You can pull it up where he was quoted saying, anyone who thinks that there isn't multiple roads to Christ, you know, there's that whole thing. You could look it up. Where he was basically presenting pluralist, a pluralist pagan, you know, approach to the Christian, to orthodoxy. And that's what you have to do. You have to, you know, water down the exclusive claims of, of orthodoxy and thereby Christianity to make it palatable. Right. That's the anti, that's the in place of, Right. And then from there, you know, we'll pull it up and we'll look at it again. But from there, you start getting into some of these other things that, you know, hey, man, they're tough and they're problematic, but they are the teachings of the church. Right. Um, The uh, the issues in regards of sexuality and gender, the issues around, um, you know, uh, choice, quote unquote, abortion. Right. That's tenant number five, I think it was, whatever, about the body being autonomous and all these things. It's, of course, that sounds good, right? But again, <laughs> you start getting into the explicit nature of it, right? Um, my body, my choice, right? Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's, you know, there's this really interesting correlation and in seeing it as, you know, spiritually on a spiritual level as, as a demonic sacrament. Right, because my body, right, and where else do we have in in the in the proper sense of this word, my body, right, when it, in during the liturgy? So we see these parallels, which, if you take them apart and just understand them on one level in regards of you know civic religion, okay, maybe not that bad, but then you upscale them and you see them on on the level of you know quote unquote movers and shakers, elites, however you want to phrase it, and the way that they use these very um you know kind of milk toast packaging to really intoxicate people and get them into this place where the the exaltation of of one's will and oneself becomes like the source of the high the highest good then you begin to see well how else would you ever get satan to be to be worshiped right it doesn't need to be quote unquote satan although you know, it's becoming interesting where you, where the thought is, eh, you know, it could maybe get to a place where it could be more explicitly being, you know, called Satan. But Satanism, as uh, as a kind of moral ideological vehicle, is absolutely becoming more acceptable, and that's the point of this first part of of, of the conversation was that going through it and you don't have that explicit term Satan, Satanism around it. Like this is this sounds great to me, but so, in order to get to that place, you have to have some of the things that we don't like about the teachings of our Lord and how they're you know lived out in the canons and the traditions of the church, right? And that's where you get people really, you know, wanting to water down certain aspects in, of the church, and, and it's no longer it loses that um, controversial aspect. Of it. Um. Here it is. Here it is, Father. The um, so uh, so this is off on Facebook. He published it that said El Pitaforos that said there are many paths which lead to the top of the mountain, and those who ignore this fact are ignorant. And I think that it's in some ways responding to his statements where he said uh, that we that who somebody what is it that we can't judge somebody by who they love saying that like um, we cannot reduce someone's sexual behavior and love life to the sole criterion of their acceptance or rejection in the church. Uh, Basically, I mean, basically making a justification for his behavior in uh, baptizing the, yeah, the child of the gay marriage. Correct. The surrogate. It was a surrogate. Surrogate. And, but it, it also becomes a vehicle for some of his more, you know, uh, ecumenist tendencies in regards of, you know, he sent, um, oh, I forget the bishop's name, you know, to that Hindu temple. And of course, subsequently that bishop has subsequently, you know, subsequently apologized, but 
Right. You know, that, that was a big deal. And, you know, we just, we burn through these things so quickly because again, just we're swimming in it and, you know, we're part of it too. Right. But we get these things through the internet, through the news cycle, through YouTube and, it, and it's fine. But you have to realize just because we're over and done with it, that doesn't minimize the real impact and, and really these things pop up, but they aren't just, their root is deeper, right? For instance, let me just. Yeah. That, if we're seeing it, then that means that there's something at the fundamental level. Yeah. By the it's time like we see the fruit, there's a yeah. huge. Yeah, exactly. It's like roaches. Exactly. If you see one roach, you got at least, you know, X amount. Thousands. More. Yeah. Thousands. Because, because by the time you're seeing one, and so the mm-hmm. thing is, it's important because like, for instance, that temple, we were t- I was talking about this with a brother, you know, a couple months ago. It's like, if you actually pull up that temple, that um, Bishop, I can't remember what his name is, spoke at, it isn't, you know, the kind of strip mall, no, we've you know, Hindu temple that opened up. In, I mean, it's, it's a mini city. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, it's a mini city. So, so it's these like movements. In, it's like in Jersey, and, right? Or something? It's in Jersey. Yeah. It's just in like. Jersey. Okay. And and I just want to say, just for the record for everybody, these things are related because, again, <clears throat> she is promoting Buddhism. And right. Buddhism is demonic. Yes. And, and, and people, people go like, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, it, it, the people hearing that because they associate Buddhism with peace and all these things and that, and that's totally mm-hmm. fine, but that's kind of the point. That's kind of the point is that the associations are what is fa- what is facilitating the watering down and the acceptance and the you know it's the pinch of incense but, trying to get but father for, 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 forgive me father that people would associate those seven tenets with peace mm-hmm. i think there's plenty of people that who would be considered reasonable educated thoughtful, moral people in Western society who would read those seven tenets, I know because I dealt with a lot of them, libertarians, nice people, wouldn't hurt a fly, who would be like, oh yeah, if you will live by these tenets, we'll have peace. That's the the, the Free State Project well, is that. Well, the thing is too, she says it in the interview, she, she has this point where she wants to say about how um, the evangelicals who wanted to bash her head in with a baseball bat or something like that to effect, which, you know, that's where we kind of separate ourselves from evangelicals if we wanted to. But I, the thing I'm trying to get at is even this sense, you know, of like peace as, as a, um, this idea of, of we're striving for peace as like the highest virtue. We're right. actually not. We're not. Don't presume that I came to bring peace. I didn't, I didn't come exactly. to bring peace, but a sword. But a sword. Right? And, and so, you know, this is, this is an interesting thing because then Again, the devil's like, cool, you want to bring a sword? And then he, he wants to push on the other end. And this mm-hmm. is where our fight and our struggle lies. Our fight and our struggle lies with the balance, with the tension, right? Not with keeping the muddy middle, but keeping the straight line, which is the king's road, which is Christ, right? So the, the, the enemy, the devil loves to twist scripture. The devil loves to twist spirituality. So... Peace, 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 right? Well, peace in itself isn't the thing we're looking for because that false peace, right, is one of the top tricks of the devil, right? Because so oftentimes, look, in the life of a in the life of a of a believer, right, who's trying to find, you know, salvation, one of the biggest things that they have to watch out for is, you know, do you want to feel better or do you want repentance? Yeah. Do you want to, you know, it's the same thing. It's like Forgive me, but there's this place where there is a, you know, kind of quote unquote relaxing aspect to saying the Jesus prayer, but that's not the point. The point isn't to have this kind of like meditation, mindfulness. It's actually the opposite. It's that's one of the things that people like, I mean, it's it's so, it's so intense. It's like, well, if it's intense, you're probably saying the prayer actually correctly. Right. Because (laughs) it's, and so this is, this is the thing, right? Because the struggle Right. The struggle in which we are, you know, birthed into in our baptism is a struggle against the powers of this world, the flesh and the devil and everything that was basically promoted in that interview. Right. Is the exaltation of the world of of the flesh, ultimately. Right. 
Um, and I, man, I'm going to say it, even of the devil, because the twisting of biblical narratives for the sake of reaching some sort of uh, exclusively psychological, you know, state of of you know of rest and and lack of conflict and inner conflict that that isn't what that isn't what the lord ushers us into in our baptism and our chrismation in our subsequent sacramental life it's a it's a life of struggle right? father so, isn't it so, father forgive me isn't it isn't it sort of coincidental that somehow when jordan peterson starts digging into the scriptures that that somehow uh, all of the gospel writers and everything, they all validate the things that he had already written in his previous uh, psychology books. Like that he was, that somehow the scriptures validate everything that he's, that he said. Isn't that just the, so, this the funniest coincidence well, uh, that that's occurring, right? Well, I just, I want to highlight something here for people. Um, so when you understand that the West and the tradition of the West is, really fundamentally built upon Augustine. Now, St. Augustine, I love St. Augustine. I have a deep reverence for St. Augustine. He's a saint, right? But he's a saint because of his confessions, not necessarily his theology, okay? And let's just understand something very key. St. Augustine is not really to be looked at for us as Orthodox in regards of his theology because his theology quote unquote, is actually philosophical and it's speculative, right? And so that theolo that speculative leading into um, scholastic, leading into psychological perspective. See the, see, the reason why Jordan Peterson resonates so well with everybody in the West is because people here, including Orthodox, this is another point I'm trying to get, a, been, been trying to get across is, People aren't actually rooted in patristics. They're rooted in the, in the philosophical tradition of the West, the scholastic tradition of the West. And so when you begin, if you know that and you begin to understand what that means, then you're able to see why so much of what is presented and so much of what Jordan Peterson says and you know, seems to line up so well is because, yeah, he's a Western man. And when people, including Orthodox, pick up on it, it's like, man, guys, you're not picking up. You're, you're picking up on, on the West still. You're, because you know what's an interesting thing is uh, psychologists will actually, the only theologian that is, quote, unquote, the only saint, quote, unquote, that's ever really referenced by psychologists is Augustine. Mm. Because what Augustine, he's the one who introduces this kind of inner dialogue with his writings. And then from there, that movement gets, you know, kind of put into the lexicon of the church, definitely of the West. And remember, he is fundamental for Western understanding. And this is the key thing. What people don't understand about what she's saying about, um, what is she talked, what is, how does she phrase about things being laid on you against your will? Um, yeah, she says the uh, conditionings condition. that were, the conditionings that were put upon you against your will. Right. So I'm referencing some, I'm referencing, you know, episode we had like, I don't know, 10 episodes ago, but there's a reason why I'm referencing that. Remember we were talking about how people don't even realize that what they're swimming in, like a lot of leftists, liberals, they don't even realize right. that their desire to want to protect the victim is Christian in of itself. Remember we were talking yes. about this, right? Yes. So this is, so what is she talking about these conditions? Christianity. Can, Christianity. She's yeah. talking about the Christian tradition, and this is the thing. This is the project that has been going, right? And so that project isn't just about the woke left uprooting gender and, you know, gender roles and sexuality, you know. Um, it's about also, you know, kind of supplanting and undermining through the other way, right? And so... When you begin to see, hey, uh, some of these narratives, it's like, yeah, I get that. Because I've known some Christians that were pretty, you know, bigoted and all this and that. It's like, yeah, you know, and I was raised, you know, my grandma you know, raised me as a, like, as a Baptist and whatever that, that narrative is going to be. It's like, you know, and this is, this is really, remember, 
satanic, right? The, the exaltation of the self, man, if people understand it's when they say, when, when the Levain especially branch of Satanists talk about like, we don't even believe in Satan as an entity. He's really, you know, an expression right, of, ego. You know, right, right, it's right, like, right, right, well, right. that should, that should scare you right there. If you really understand what the ego is, you know, people don't understand, like, how do you understand the ego in the sense of being orthodox? Well, I can tell you how to understand the ego in the sense of being orthodox. Paul calls it the old man, mm. right? That, that's what the ego is. Paul calls it the old man, or he also calls it the flesh, right? And so, you know, we get into the whole thing and talk about the gnomic will and all this good stuff. But, like, the point being is that these things which we are trying to crucify so that we can be in union with God, who is the only source of good. See, that's the other thing. When you want to, that's the problem with this pagan religion. Um, when you want to have a good outside of God, it's not really a good. And, and that, that theological understanding, that's part of the problem that people have with us because that makes us sound unsophisticated. It makes us sound, you know, you know, barbarous and bigoted and all those things. But I'm telling you, as an Orthodox Christian, if you don't understand that there is no good apart from God, then that's why people find themselves, I, don't, I left the church. I didn't need the church anymore, right? Because I can be an atheist and still have morality. I can be that's, whatever I want to be and still be a good moral person. And that's that how do you is, judge the good? You can't judge the good. Well, that's the, this, this is like the this is the brilliance of this is why orthodoxy for me, and I have a philosophy background. This is why orthodoxy for me like shines forth and was so obvious that this is right because these are all the questions that are like left as yeah. underpants gnome that are about value and it's like what is the highest thing what is the highest thing because i can't know what if something is good or not unless i know what the highest thing is because it is against the highest thing that i judge the good and it's like oh it's the highest thing is god <laughs> like and and so there is no good all you're doing when you go down is you're just getting farther from him. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's so obvious from a philosophical level that it's like when someone's like, no, I can't have good without the highest thing. It's like, no, you can't. You have no that's way. Right. You, you, you can't. Ju you actually can't. That's right. I mean, wouldn't right. that be then the justification for the behavior? I mean, to, to what father was saying yeah. is like, is so to normalize whatever to use that term to normalize satanism by couching it in this whole it's not as weird as you think like it's not as weird as you think and we're actually pretty good people it's kind of the same uh normalization of atheism it's like i don't really need your god i don't really need your rules to be a good person because i have it like i can figure it out for myself so it's almost like well atheism is satanism well, that's, yeah, that's the point. The commonality there is a big one. The commonality. No, 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 it's not, uh, Andrew, it's not a big one. It's the, it, it is the same thing. It's another name for the yes. exact same thing. But this is what I'm saying. I'm saying if you look at the commonality between the two things, you should realize that the commonality is big enough. You're actually looking at ah, the same right. thing. You're looking okay, at the same enough. thing because um, really it's, if you're going to define your entire life, like you know your personality in defiance of it's like it's like no i don't believe in god it almost as a it's like the 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 fuel that kind of goes that keeps that train going or whatever that train that lack of belief is defiance is this whole like no i reject the idea that there's something bigger than me that dictates my life one because i've never seen it and two that puts me in a place emotionally spiritually and whatever that i don't like I don't want to be second to something because I really can't believe because that ultimately the lack of hierarchy, well, the you, sorry. You know just, who said that, Andrew? You know who said that? Church lady voice? Satan? Yep. I was just about <laughs> to say. That's what I'm saying. I was just about so to say. When yep. when um oh I had it. I can't remember. Anyway, there was another point I wanted to make about that that it's it, it's again it's it's kind of just reiterating but it's bringing it down to a level of like okay these things are a lot more because it's almost like um oh it's almost kind of like being gay right 
your whole identity is based around the rejection of the thing and you think that this thing i.e uh, a, a quote-unquote normalization of heterosexuality which is by the way not a thing like I mean, anyway but it's your whole life is in defiance of that that this thing foisted upon you i'm saying if you have the eyes to see and the ears to hear when you look at all this stuff the commonalities the links there what you used to look like four different cities are actually all one big city. It's like, oh, are all looking at the same, it's the same thing. Well, w one of the things that is really important to understand is that it, it, it it's, multi it's accomplishing lots of things at once. Number one, it's getting people to find the source, the common denominator, the, 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 um, the kind of litmus to be anything but Christ. This mm -hmm. is really important because when you start defining everything according to something outside of Christ, and again, as, as Orthodox Christians, that is our litmus. We start to, and that's, that's why we exist, right? And that's, that's why we are Israel, right? Is because we're, we're to bring, we're to usher in that truth for, for the sake of the healing of the nations, right? Because the healing of the nations only happens when the nations are turned to the light, the source of good, which is Christ, right? But the light bringer says, no, there is another light, right? And that light, which will illumine your path, is yourself. And if you begin to understand that yourself is the referent, right, then you're on your way. And it's very easy to have a sense of, you know, Christian quote-unquote Christian morality and have yourself be the referent. Have yourself be the, the very thing which is, you know, the reference, the litmus, right? And again, to make it really explicit, that at its core is Satanism. Is to get yourself yeah. to look to yourself as the referent, as the source of light. And, it, and, it, and it's being done in such a way that you have all of the packaging right, without the real thing. So for instance, the resistance, right? What is the inversion? Well, well, as Christians, there is a resistance that we have to really um, embrace. It's a resistance against the world. It's a resistance against ourself. It's a resistance against the devil. But one of the key ways that that pl gets played out is in our awareness, in our defense of not Christendom, but of Christ. This is really key. Because the defense of Christendom is growing, right? But that defense of Christendom is happening by people who don't even believe that Jesus is God. Yeah. Right? So there's this 100%. You got, you know, I'm going to call out some names that, you know, Officer Tatum guy was talking about that, you know, Officer Tatum, um, real big, like conservative YouTube guy, black mm -hmm. conservative, you know, yep. YouTube yep. guy, talks a lot about Christianity, Christian values. You know, it's the thing that it's one of the kind of key things that he gets, you know, in regards to connecting with Trump. Um, you know, we, I can, we can go on. Um, and that and it's interesting to me because it there is this I'm kind of like de I'm deconstructing it like mid sentence. But in, I'm even yeah, thinking real about, time. Huh? In real time here. <laughs> in real time. I'm even thinking about I'm trying to think that there's that one guy. um Jay debated him. I'm trying to think what his name is. He's a he's a hip hop guy. He's a conservative hip hop guy. Jay has had him on a couple times. Um, someone will clickety clack and put it in there. But he's another one. Um, but you know, like he does, he did all these these um, you know throws out songs, raps about like Trump and conservative and quote unquote mm -hmm. Christian values. But he doesn't believe in the Trinity, right? Um, it's it's um, a Kanye move when before he you know, mm -hmm. kind of went back to Satan's mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. But the whole, you know, like getting into the thing with like Jesus and, and this movement. Right. And, and the reason why I think the correlation in regards of, well, you know, you look at where is the popular culture and even in regards of uh, Amber um, Rose. Amber Rose, right, and her yep. connection there. And she's very explicit in her Satanism, like we talked about. Yeah. And very explicit yeah. in like, hey, Satanism, you know, is 
Satanists, I find, are way better people than a lot of Christians. Like that narrative, right? right all of those things are, are starting to coalesce. And you can be like, what are you talking about? Well, it's real simple. You have Amber Rose, who is at the RNC, who is explicitly, you know, promoting Satanism, right? Explicitly promoting, you know, immorality, right? People, lots of people at the RNC, lots of people support him being like, hey, listen, don't be such a stickler, right? People need mm-hmm. to learn, they need to see if you're for Trump, right? It doesn't matter whether you're black, white, gay, straight, whatever. Because we, right? So the, wow. the product and all of this, if you just kind of zoom out and it's like, well, those things, those movements, you're starting to see this, some sort of religion forming. You're seeing a religion form mm-hmm. in front of your eyes, mm-hmm. which the hallmark is, you know, we're, we, we want to take things back, right? Um, mm-hmm. We want morality. We want decency, right? We want all these good things, which who isn't for these things, right? Who's for mm-hmm. demons? Who's for mul- mutilation of kids? Who's for, you know, the destruction of traditional values? Who wants these things, right? Nobody wants these things, right? And the only way to really do that is you got to get Christ out of there. You, you have to take the true Christ out because that true Christ will say, hey, <laughs> I didn't Knock come. It off. I came to bring a sword, essentially. Yes. Because those yeah. exclusive, because when we start getting into some of the claims of the church, right, what's it going to be? It's like, look, man, that's great. You know, you guys are this and this and that. And when it comes down to it, Look, we got to make some compromises to to fight this this bigger battle, and it's like, wow, <laughs> that's so all the all the martyrs, all the saints. No, nah, we'll make some compromises. It's that's, like, that's the Christian thing to do is to make Christians Christian known we'll for their com- they're known for their compromises. <laughs> like it, it reminds me of these people who I've run into, and I, I remember this back in the um, Friendster. And um, mm-hmm. beta MySpace days, like the first kind of ortho chats, ortho, ortho discussions have been going on the internet ever since there's been chat rooms, whatever. But I remember an early conversation about someone being like, Yeah, do I really gotta accept icons? And I'll never forget, there's people who are like, No, it's you can kind of take it or leave it, whatever. And I've seen it now because you know, I've had to deal with that. <laughs> Iconoclasm. I've had to deal with that in recent <laughs> years with people. They're like, Well, I like all this and that, but icons, it's like, yeah, because our our forefathers, our ancestors, spiritually speaking, spilt their blood for it. Like for it's this. not, you know, what they I'm dealt saying? with it. It's dealt with. It's done. It's dealt with, and it's done. And and obviously, it's something that is worth dividing over. See, that's the mm-hmm. thing is, the the thing about peace and all this stuff, it's a trap, man, because it gets us to be like, look, we just don't want to look like we're mean. I just don't want to mm-hmm. be mean. I don't want to, and and that. You cannot be scared to be <laughs> unity for the sake of unity is mm-hmm. not the unity of Christ. Mm-hmm. It, it, mm-hmm. It's just not. And if you're with Christ, you have to be willing to be divided. You have to be willing to separate from someone for his sake. That sounds too harsh for you. He who doesn't, he who doesn't love me more than mother, brother, father, sister is not mm-hmm. worthy of. Mm-hmm. And this is, this is the thing. How do you keep your salt in these days? Well, St. Paisios, like a lot of the other contemporary saints, saints are throwing the same thing. You know, we don't have, and we are not going to have the ascetic feats of the fathers of old. We're not going to have it. You know what St. Paisios says? He says the way that people are going to find salvation is they're going to maintain the traditions of the church and they're going to pass it on to their children and God willing, their grandchildren. That's it. And when he says traditions, he's not talking about the external watered down, you know, quote unquote, passing off traditions that unfortunately, you know, a lot of just cultural Orthodox have done. Forgive me. Right. Because these same people, they'll be the same ones that will say, this is kind of extreme, you know, let God figure that stuff out. Let God figure that stuff out. And it's like, it's not even about fire insurance. It's just, you know, if you really love Christ and you know that Christ is God, and if you really love other people, it's like the compromise is is anything but love, because this is this is the truth. And if it sounds crazy and fundamentalist to you, well, that's too bad. 
right? And this and this is the trap because now you have real time a Christianity that says, "Hey, we can we can find a way to work all these things out without <laughs> the exclusive claims of the church." You know, closed communion, no good. Icons, no good. You know, uh, female female priests, like you know, like female clergy. Yeah. It had to be unified on all that stuff. So, and even in the Bush in regards of, you know, this is, this is one of the things if you start seeing it's, it's that it's the, it's like Tiamat with all the heads, you know, <laughs> or it's, you know, it's uh, the octopus with the, with the many tentacles. It's like you, there's so many all leading to this one hub. Right. There's so many problematic things that are pushing towards a marginalization of these things of the church, which make the church the church. And what does that mean to make the church the church? What are you talking about? Well, it's when it's the salt. If we lose our salt, we're good for nothing. Mm. Right. So that salt is where we say, yes, that's all great and dandy. And I can love you regardless of, you know, sure, your religion your sexual preference. I can love you regardless of that, but you got to understand what love is. <laughs> and you got to understand what I mean by love. My love isn't, isn't condoning because that's, again, that's not loving you, right? Um, and that whole mindset, and I think maybe you'd agree with me, Super. I mean, that, that's one of the reasons why I had to really, um, a, a long while ago, even though I sympathize on a philosophical and ideological level with it, but fundamentally, I had to let go of libertarianism because that ethos, yeah. it doesn't yeah. fit with orthodoxy because the kind of do whatever yeah. you want, you know, it's, it's good for a pagan sense. And in mm -hmm. one hand, we can do that, right? So I'll, I'll give someone a bone, right? On one sense, you can do that in regards of, okay, well, if I'm going to let you do what you're going to do, as long as it doesn't kind of hurt anything, which that's a whole, mm -hmm. does that sound familiar? Do it that well mm -hmm. as long. Anyways. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, mm -hmm. but my exclusive claims have to be maintained. The second that I can't mm -hmm. maintain them, then the deal's off. Right. Mm -hmm. as, as long as you guarantee me that I get to hold all, all my exclusive claims. Right. Which is another funny thing mm -hmm. in her interview. She says, she talks about the problem in regards of making Satanism an official religion is because, you know, you had to open it up to everybody. And she talked about right. Richard Ramirez, right? Right. And right. how Richard Ramirez early on, you know, with some of the that second wave of Satanists wanting to, you know, be very open about, you know, accepting him and adopting him in. But Richard, that problem mm -hmm. being like you can't do it because of obvious um, the, the social stigma with... The Night Stalker, who was a serial yeah, killer. He was nice a serial killer. killer. Yeah, who was a who was an avowed Satanist, right? Who terrorized. I, I remember that. I remember I the way he terrorized um, people. Yeah, I was in California at the time too. Yeah. I, I was. That was what man. The way that people were. Father, I mean, it's this is to the point about the libertarianism. Like, yeah, what I've definitely realized is, and this is actually an interesting conversation that I was I was having with somebody. Uh, actually, yesterday, somebody who had interviewed me back in 2020, and he was like, "Hey, Cyprian. I wrote this blog." Cyprian. What? Please forgive me. What? Go. Don't don't lose your thought. I just want to finish Go. that thought because everyone's gonna be like, "What's he talking about? Why do you bring up Richard Ramirez?" Forgive me. Don't lose that thought. The reason why I'm bringing all that up is in the interview, she says that you have to open up your religion to accept everybody. Because if you don't, then it's just a social club. This is what she's saying. And she says this is the crossroads that her father came, came up against in trying to get a bigger promotion of Satanism post the kind of like that initial thing with the, with the club, um, you know, the, um, the Sammy Davis and them. The reason why I bring this up, and I'll just stop there so that thought's complete so people don't think What's it, what the hell is he talking about. People have to understand something. One of the things that has been underneath everything, especially since 20, right, is the eroding of the exclusivity, quote unquote, of the church. This is, this is where we have to, this is the ground. This is the hill we have to die on. This is why I'm bringing this up, because that movement of, no, 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 
if you're going to have a religion, it has to be open to everybody. And I heard them and go like, actually, no, because we have a whole process of catechesis. We have a whole process where we can say to someone, no, no. If you don't adhere to the tenets of the church, if you don't adhere to the canons, the dogmas of the church, if you're not going to be obedient to the church, right, which includes, you know, we tell you who you can marry, you know, uh, you can't take communion here and in the Roman Catholic Church and in the Presbyterian Church. You can't do these things. This is why I wanted to say that. So that's why all this stuff, I'm trying to make it real tangible for people. All this stuff, which seems abstract and intellectual, this is how it's playing out. And this is real time what you're going to see. And this is, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the movements that people have felt from hierarchs and quote unquote, you know, quote unquote theologians and people speaking for the church and trying to make the church palatable. This is the problem in, in that it's opening up this wave of people wanting to bring in the barbarians are already at the gates. They want, they want orthodoxy to be a civic religion, just like everything else. So forgive me, go ahead. Well, if there's a, I, I mean, it's to that point of bringing, of allowing everyone to come in and having a lack of exclusivity. I think really my illusions about libertarianism, it took going and living in New Hampshire and being part of the free state project mm -hmm. for my illusions to be shattered because there was something about, cause it had that nature where they were like, Oh, it's open to, to everybody. And the whole idea was just like, Oh, don't hurt people and don't take their stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think that what I've come to understand was that, when that's a prescription, when it's like, okay, this is the only, th and it's basically do as thou wilt, right? But it's like, when that's the prescription, don't, if that's your morality and that's your virtue, and it's just like, what, do whatever you want so long as you're not stealing from somebody and you're not infringing on their bodily autonomy. There's so much damage that you can do to another person without stealing from them or infringing on their bodily autonomy. And like when you have something like that, it just attracts people who are like going to, to, to the worst. But what I've realized is, this is a conversation I was literally having yesterday. What I've realized is that it's actually, it's an inversion. Because if you're living a life oriented toward Christ, you, for, as a description of you at like a high level material that person isn't hurting people and taking other people's stuff, right? Like they're not, but they're not doing it for the sake of not hurting people and not taking it, uh, taking people's stuff. They're doing it because they're leading a life that is oriented towards Christ and they're working toward their salvation. And yeah. that those actions where they would be physically hurting people and taking their stuff is not part of that. Yeah, It's not, they're just not oriented toward that. And so I think that it's like, this description, because the descri what the conversation that I was having was somebody who was like putting this virtue on morality and living a moral life, mm -hmm. and it's like I I know that that like in in going and then reading as I was talking to this person and reading things that that elders had said and fathers that it was more like morality is a description of the life of a Christian, but a Christian is not living in a moral, because that would be moralism, is not living in this more, it does not have a moral code mm -hmm. because it's not about the morals for the sake of the, the morals. It's right. not about the rules for the sake of the rules. It's like, yeah. if you live, if you live your life oriented towards Christ, you will be a moral person. Anybody looking would be like, oh, so it's really that it's like this description is is like a description of a of the way that a Christian is an actual Christian is living because they're oriented towards Christ, not because they're trying to live by a rule book. Yeah, I yes, I want to interject just a couple of things which I think might be interesting. Yeah, please. Yes, if if someone is living a Christian life authentically, then people will be like, "Oh, that's a kind of moral person," right? At the same time, however. And I think this is where this is where we're, I think, headed. This is what we're trying to highlight is I would say now, though, if someone's living a Christian life, they'll actually find themselves at odds with people now. Yes. Because of the paganism, because of, again, paganism being <laughs> civic religion. Do you see what I'm saying? 
So the hallmark now, yes. woe unto you when men speak well of you as our right. master taught us. Right. Right. And that's super important, especially for us in this modern age in West, because we are all victims of vainglory and people pleasing and ego. And so we just want people to think we're good, good people. And, and we just want to get along. I mean, isn't that interestingly enough, so much of the vitriol and the rage that the left has is you're mean, you're mean. Well, right? well that's every problem they have with Trump. And exactly. That's exactly. all. That's and the only problem they have with him. They don't have exactly. Any and him. so watch this. And it's not talking out of both sides of the neck. So then you have this movement, which we were talking about earlier, where to offend becomes a, a virtue. <laughs> Do you see? But the offense isn't for the sake of Christ. It's for the sake of still, well, yeah, people pleasing is weak. And like, I don't care what people think. But all that is is pride, right? So on the one hand, the vainglory, right? The left and like, hey, you're mean and all this and that. I don't, and I, I'm a Christian. I don't want to, I don't want to be mean. I want people to think I'm a nice guy. That's vainglory, right? Vainglory and pride. How do you distinguish the two? There's a couple things, but to make it really simple, vainglory is external. Pride is internal. Vainglory is I care too much about what people think. Pride is I don't give a rip what anyone thinks. Both of them are in error. So on the one hand, you have this movement, which is what we're saying. Yeah, I'm tired of this PC just trying to say whatever, you know, needs to be said to get along. So then saying anything now becomes a virtue. But that's that's problematic, too. And so how do you reconcile this thing? Well, again, when you, when you aren't actually living an authentic Christian life, then you aren't actually living in a way where you're united with, with God. And so let me just say this. You really understand something. The Ten Commandments, right, it was the beginning of trying to establish the, the, the vertical and the horizontal, right? The vertical, the connection between how to be right with God, the horizontal, how to be right with your, with your neighbor, Right. So that's great. But where do we see the Ten Commandments actually fulfilled? In Christ. In Christ. Yeah. In Christ. And so what Christ does is you can no longer, because, again, if it was possible, people want the Ten Commandments, but they don't want God. They want a God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hear me on that. They want a God, but they don't want God, right? Who is God? God's the Holy Trinity. Holy Trinity. If you look at Christ, you see the fullness of the God, right? So if you, you can have a God and have the Ten Commandments, right? I mean, this reality is, I know it's tough, but you got to understand, if you don't look around and see how things which seemingly don't make any sense actually are starting to make perfect sense. When you can see someone like Amber Rose, you know, being a mouthpiece and a figurehead for quote unquote conservative values. When you see. Um, That's so crazy. Just <laughs> Yeah. It's crazy. I know. It's crazy. It's, this it's is crazy. Where we're at. It's That's insane. Where we're at. It's insane. When, when you see people who will be like, yeah, you know, um, They'll even say Christ is king, but Christ isn't God. Well, mm -hmm. that makes perfect sense, actually, if you're ushering in an antichrist. Well, the Muslims believe that. They they believe he's, the, the Muslims believe he's coming back. He's not. He's not God. He's just a prophet, but he is yeah. coming back in the body to lead them. And so, hey, uh, hey a, king, a king can be changed. And hey, you can change a king. Listen, when you listen, I've, I've been paying fairly close attention to the UK thing. And what I mean by fairly close attention, I'm not paying attention to what the government and what the political leaders, I'm trying to watch interviews and listen to what the people on the street are saying. And when you actually listen to what the people are saying, right? And when I say the people, I mean both sides, right? I'm telling you, I see, I see a resolution can come real easy because a resolution, right, that solves the problem 
with Gaza, with Jerusalem, is the same solution that's going to solve the problems going on with the with the mass migration. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Because Judaism, Islam, right, evangelical Christianity, right, um, just Christianity, basically any Christianity besides true orthodoxy, it all fits in, no problem. The 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 issue is right. This is the issue theologically. The issue is orthodoxy. And that's why yeah, 100%. like hundred percent Metropolitan of, of Blessed Memory, he's a saint, you know, Metropolitan Amphilochius, right? That's why when he said straight up, the only thing standing in the way of the NWO is the is the Orthodox Church. He said that a couple of years before, you know, um he you know he died. Um there's a reason why he said that. Because you, you look at the movement in the Balkans, you, you look at these movements and you look at the need to de- because it's obviously not Rome. Rome's not standing <laughs> Rome's not standing the way of anything. Rome is the glue with all of this, right? It's and that's why you see you see certain voices being treated and, and, and taken out the way they are. That's why in some regards this thing with Ukraine is so interesting is because you you have right in front of your very eyes, you know, we've said this before, but you're seeing the birth of, of, of there's already two, there's already two churches existing in parallel with each other. Right. And yes, on a moral level, but also on, you know, an ecclesiastical level, which is moving into the geopolitical, right. And the geopolitical matters, you know, on the one hand, it's like, you were just talking about this last night. It's like, you know, I just want to pay my bills. I just want to be able to take my kids to the library. That's like my big thing, you know? It's like, yeah. But you got to understand that the the dichotomies are always the problem. And that's how it's always been. You get people so where they can't think about anything else, right? They're struggling just to, just to, that's the big thing about the working class man is the working class man is kept down by being preoccupied in such a way with just survival, Right. And that's that's a big push here. But what's interesting is the life of the church, if 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 someone's actually trying to live the life of the church, it by proxy, it de facto begins to lift you out of those things. Why? Because you start living, being guided by the living, (laughs) you're being guided by the living God and the living God will always keep you in tension. That's why you can never. That's why you can never be comfortable. You can't be comfortable in this world if you're really seeking, you know, illumination and 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 and, and salvation. Because that it's it's a fundamental aspect. It's it doesn't make any sense if you look at the teachings of the church, the life of the church, and you contrast it with how the vast majority of, you know. The perception of people, how it should be lived out, those things, there's that cognitive dissonance is crazy. It's crazy. It's like you have to throw out, and again, people don't pay attention to Vespers or anything, anyways, you know, but you have to throw out all the hymnography, all the patristic writings, all the scripture. You have to throw it all out if you want to have this, you know, state religion where everything is kind of sweet. Um, but when you're in the spirit, quote unquote, when you're living according to a life of, Purification, moving to elimination, divication, you're going to always be in tension. Yeah. I mean, because then the prevailing agenda is not Christ, because it can't be, because then it would be problematic. Um, so, Father, I have one, I had a question for you. Um, like, what would you, what would you say to the person? So I've actually had this criticism a couple times and I just wanted to touch on it before we end it or whatever. It, it might be a little bit off topic, but it's night. I, I don't think it is. But what would you say to the person that would levy the criticism against us that we spend far too much time talking about the danger of the right? We don't really touch a whole bunch on what the left, where the danger is in the left. Like, do you know, are you picking up what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's so okay. that's super simple. 
Yeah, I thought That's so, super but simple. I've, I've had a couple of people talk to me and be like, you spend so much time ragging on the MAGA crowd, but yet, you know, the other side over here is openly doing the awful things that they're doing. So how can we yeah. talk about that more? But then, so, then uh, saying that actually indicates exactly the answer. Their, yeah, their they're, question they're, is the answer. <laughs> yeah, they're the reason why we have to keep talking about it. Yes. They're the reason why I have to keep talking about it. You know, we're going to have a we have a two hour long conversation about um, why we need to breathe air. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. You know exactly. I mean? Yeah. But why? And so, if I mean, if you want to get into the ascetical literature, see, that's the other thing is, forgive me. And, and all you people, like, don't get mad, right? Stick around. Like, like believe it or not, I would say, it, well, you're the reason why this project exists. Like the person who's like, why are you always talking about the right? You're the exact person I'm trying mm -hmm. to like speak to. And hopefully like you stick around, whatever, because this is the thing I want you to see is you're not going <laughs> to, if you read the ascetical literature of the church, right. And, and if you begin to become immersed in it, right. And the neptic literature of the church, right. The devil doesn't, he can, if you're, if, if you're struggling, if you're new or whatever, but, but the devil isn't coming to uh, he's not going to knock you out with prostitutes and crap because you get to a place. If, if you're, if you're in the church already, well, theoretically, right. Cause that's a whole thing. Right. But you, you've moved past certain things or like, if you're at a point where you're like, Hey, I'm a crusader, I'm doing this. And that's a whole other thing too, by the way, because there's this weird movement that happens where someone's like, Hey, I'm fighting for the, I'm fighting for the moral or for the right, whatever. But underneath, they're kind of doing some weird stuff. You know what I mean? That's a thing, right? So I just want to say that the reality is, is there's no point in talking about the obvious errors of the left. Like, okay, great, and? Yeah. <laughs> but look, here, here's, here's another way to make it real simple. I just, uh, again, here's one for the coffee mug. The Antichrist is not going to be a 500-pound crack-smoking black lesbian. Like, mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. that isn't, that's not how, that, that's not it, right? Mm -hmm. The Antichrist, you know, and the Antichrist spirit doesn't move in ways that are so obviously repugnant to a moral, quote-unquote, Christian mindset, right? Mm -hmm. That's not where, that's not where the real struggle, that's not where the real worry is. And... Here's the thing. Um, I would just reference again the interview I did with DPH a couple of weeks ago. It's like we gotta, there's there's been a problem where people like listen. Just I'm just just for the record, um, when the church fathers talk about you know um, Jewish like the like Jews. They're not, they're talking about the religion. <laughs> yeah. They're not talking yeah. about, <laughs> they're not talking about to, to isolate like a certain ethnic like group of people, mm -hmm. right? That's a whole other thing to talk about, whatever. But the point I'm just trying to get across is like, we have a real problem, Houston, right? And that mm -hmm. problem is, is that people's movement, right? They are coming to, or to the Orthodox Church not to be Christians and not to find salvation, but because they're finding a coalescing and a, and a, um, a kind of LARPing around pagan, like civic religion. Forgive me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. That that's the problem. That is the problem. Right. And so there's no point in talking about the obvious problems of the left because they're obvious problems. I, I said, a few times why would we need to it they're just it's just right there you just throw a stick at anything and it's right there so i think yeah i think that that's much less eloquently what father is trying to say is it doesn't need to be said it's just like we know about it that's the i guess maybe that would be the flame and then the other side would be the tinder it would be that would be like the the stuff ready to go off like that would be the flame like Nobody needs to talk about how hot the flame is. You just need to talk about the damage it could do 
to the mm-hmm. side that's susceptible to its its nature. Well, I mean, Andrew, I think like one of the things for me is I can't be tempted. I can't be tempted. This is really simple. You cannot tempt me with something I am repulsed by. Yeah. yeah. Like you cannot tempt me into gluttony by putting a plate of poop in front of me. <laughs> you cannot tempt me into lust by putting like a pile of corpses in front of me. Right. It cannot be done. And so like the if you're repulsed by the left, but you want us to come on here and and you want to watch us talk bad about something that you're repulsed by, that's of no value to you. Right. Yeah. You can that's it. You, you're the devil. The, the devil cannot tempt you with that. But what he is tempting you with is a sense of righteousness and a rightness of, of the pharisaical idea mm-hmm. that like, oh, it's them and not me. Mm-hmm. So if we yeah. came on and did that, we're just contributing to your sin. Right. Yeah, that's exactly like, it. That's exactly it. And, you know, just just we're clear here, too. There's a correlation between the two, by the way, in the regards of the person not being tempted by the corpses and the poop, if you persist in your indulgence of temptations from the right, arrogance, hatred, um, pride, these things, you will come to a place where um, you will be tempted by the poop and the corpses. Because this is why you have this movement of people coming to a religious understanding. Uh, that's an old trope of the 80s and the 90s, right? The, you know, the, the big mega pastor being found in the bathrooms and in the parks, right? Um, engaging in debaucherous behavior. Just people need to have it be explained to them, right? Listen to me. There is, you'd be surprised. Um, there's a particular... Um, I was informed of this and it's going to have to be cryptic so you guys can figure it out yourselves. But, you know, there's, there's a particular uh, conservative talking head of a younger stripe who, you know, kind of oddly enough is there's been this whole thing about him coming out and being interested in, in, in very, um, you know, perverse kind of things, you know, I'm talking about, right. I think so uh, the, you know, and, and I know personally, you know, anecdotally, about where that happens, where there's people who come into the church and they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, oh, and by the way, behind closed doors, they're doing X, Y, and Z, or they're interested in X, Y, and Z. Now let's just make something really clear, right? I just want to give a patristic insight into this, okay? Tradition, St. Nikolai Venerovich, he says, you know, in tradition, in regards of when the Lord is writing, you know, the woman who's caught in adultery and the Lord comes to defend her, right? And he stoops down. You know, they're like, hey, she was caught in the very act, right, um, mm-hmm. in the gospel. Well, and he begins to stoop down and write in the in the. In yeah, the yeah, he writes in the dirt. What's that all about? Do you know what he's writing? He's no. writing. He's writing the sins of the Pharisees that were there to ah. stone her. And the sins are like sodomy, right. adultery, all of these right. things. He's he writes the name of of. The rabbi right. and writes sodomy, writes adultery, writes whatever. Right. And when they saw their names, they dropped their stones. He who is without sin cast the first stone. That's right. interesting because I always, I always heard he is that where he drew a line. No, 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 no. no, no. He okay, just, so, it just says that, that it says in the gospel he he knelt down, and began to write in in the in the yeah, earth. Because, in the dirt. I think that's a holdover from my Protestant life because I always heard it presented as he drew a line in the sand and they were like, go ahead and throw mm-hmm. the rock. That makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Okay. No, no. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it also lines up with, again, the ascetical and neptic literature of the church in regards of the person who begins to enjoy a pharisaical disposition will then find themselves mm-hmm. more susceptible, you know, paradoxically to sins on the left again. Yeah, like mm-hmm. you basically open yourself up, right, to debauchery again. Yeah, right, because of your lack of watchfulness, right? Mm. Yeah, you lose. I was about to say you lose vigilance. Yeah, because you're like, oh, I could never, I could never fall for that. Because look at me, I'm the right. main one speaking out against it, and then it's like, right, right the in. Whole process yeah. of that makes like, total right. sense. The whole yep. process of questioning yourself and your motives behind things gets shut down. Yes, 
it's like okay, yes that's how you know that's how it creeps fascinating back it makes so much sense too yeah so i think i we think get, we've hit two hours andrew yeah it's two hours i'm sorry i'm struggling a little bit too i don't have tea tonight so i was kind of struggling <laughs> to stay awake a little bit but that's all right um so if you guys want to reach out to us please reach out to us at contact at royalpath.network there's also andrew at royalpath.network you want to talk to me personally it's going to take a little bit longer but that's okay uh there is the uh, scola coffee connected through mount tabor which is a church which is connected to or which is a school connected to our parish here in kansas city please check out the link in the description it's pretty dang good coffee lots of people have been sending me emails that they like it it's really good um also if we mention a song it goes on the playlist podcast royal path podcast playlist or something like that it's on spotify and apple music then from there thank you jack uh thumbnails credible um oh it's great what was the last one last week's one was really really oh no 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 it was the uh saint marina one that was the one i was where she's just got the little demon she's like hitting it with the hammer i just i always love it um and then uh i feel like that that's it uh, I feel like that's it. So yep. we'll just stay there. Okay. Thank you very, very much. Uh, having a good night. Bye bye. Bye bye.